good evening everyone and thanks for choosing to spend your time uh, with us today evening i know the opportunity cost of spending an evening in bangalore are huge so thank you so much for being here uh, what we thought we'll do is i'll quickly give some background about uh, the semiconductor industry so that we are all on the same page when we are discussing uh, some of the concepts and ideas that will come up going ahead so very quickly it is a very simplified version i know there are people here who have worked in the semiconductor industry for uh, much more than i have so i i am not they will find it very rudimentary but the idea is just to get all of us on the same page so really quickly i have just four five slides to share i'll share that and then we can start so uh, semiconductor ic is what we are talking about when we talk about integrated circuits or colloquially we call them as chips so essentially you have electronic components in which there are semiconductors and there are non semiconductors so the semiconductor word indicates conductivity electrical conductivity which is between an insulator and between a conductor right in a conductor the electron flow is so huge that you can't control it in an insulator it is so less that it's of no use but in semiconductors if you can treat it properly you can control the flow of current in one part of the circuit uh, can be used to control the current which is flowing in another part of the circuit this is basically a huge superpower because you can make a uh, you can make something called a transistor and that can be used as an amplifier as a switch into many many things right so it's like a superpower earlier vacuum tubes were used to do that but in transistors you can do that at a fraction of the cost and fraction of the power so that was the big jump and semiconductors uh, there are non semiconductors also like inductors etc so we are not talking about that within semiconductors there are various components memory logic uh, analog optoelectronic you know leds uh, discrete and sensors so when we talk about chips and ic's we are referring to the first four and they were colloquially called chips account for roughly 80% of the semiconductor sales so that's what the people talk about when they are largely talking about semiconductor geopolitics etc right now very quickly how this uh, chip uh sem supply chain exists that's what i am going to talk about so this is largely for a digital logic chip how does it work right so very broadly there are three stages that are used uh, the three stages are design manufacturing and assembly and test this is very rough division but it helps us to understand how this uh, entire industry is divided so think about your apple phone or your an uh, android phone first apple or samsung will say that i want a phone which can do this kind of functionality play a game with this kind of latency delay or those kinds of functionalities are given by a company like apple and then there will be uh, people in the apple hardware team which will say okay if you want to realize this kind of functionality how is it that you design and architect those things into a chip right what are the amount of transistors you require how are they connected how what kind of graphics accelerator that you require all that happens in the design stage right so in that the uh, inputs are intellectual property components and obviously one i think in the previous session uh, also uh, mike spence mentioned that uh, you use uh, there are approximately in a per millimeter square uh, you have now have uh, roughly 140000 transistors or so on right so if you want to achieve that kind of functionality you can do that by hand so there are some eda companies which do that these are essentially software which is used to do that so this is a human capital intensive stage uh, blueprints of chips get made essentially in this nothing physical gets made it's just a blueprint which gets out of the stage uh, and this stage accounts for roughly 33% of the value addition in the entire supply chain us is a dominant player and examples of companies you would have heard about is apple amd qualcomm right so this is the first stage very quickly uh, the manufacturing stage is the second stage this is what everyone's talking about over the last 2 uh, 3 years and this is a very capital intensive stage right so to set up a new uh, 
uh, really leading edge uh, manufacturing company today, a manufacturing fab, which we call, it costs around $12 billion, the latest one, on 5 nanometer. For reference, India's Department of Space budget is less than $1 billion, right? So just to give you a scale of the kind of things you would require at the cutting edge. So a uh, capital intensive stage, uh, blueprints are converted into physical IC. So finally, the output, the design output is just some files, they get converted into something physical called a wafer and that is the output of this stage. It accounts for roughly 56% of the value addition. Uh, so because there are very complex equipments, you can imagine if you want to pack so many million transistors in a small space, what is the kind of uh, machinery that is required? One particular machine which ASML, uh, another, a Dutch company makes, uh, it costs around $200 million a pop, right? So that's the kind of scale we're talking about. Uh, so e East Asia is a dominant player in this. Uh, we'll discuss why and so on and so forth. But some players in this segment that now people know of is TSMC, UMC, and manufacturing equipment by players like ASML and LAM. Third stage is the final stage, which is assembly, test, and packaging. It is a labor-intensive stage, so there are uh, there are machinery required, but also you need a large number, number of people. And here ICs are assembled, so the wafer is basically cut into small chips and they are packaged such that uh, you don't have static uh, disabilities on the chip, etc. So ICs are assembled and packaged and connected to the rest of the device. This segment accounts for roughly 12% of the value addition. Um, again, East Asia is a dominant player uh, with some companies that we wouldn't generally hear of because they are in at the back end, uh, Amcor, JSET, and AAC. Finally, uh, Srini mentioned that I should rough, briefly talk about this as well. So this is how it looks. Uh, on the y-axis, uh, you will see 5 nanometer, 10 nanometer. That is roughly an indicator of the smallest feature size in a chip. So the smaller that number is, the more transistors you can pack in a smaller area. And the more transistors you can pack, the bigger functionality you can achieve. So roughly we can think of it that way. So when we say 5 nanometers, it is the most advanced one because the feature sizes are the smallest. So these are the uh, companies which are sort of arranged. So when we talk about your processor in your Apple phone, that will be the 5 nanometer segment. But when you talk about, let's say, washing machines or dishwashers, they will also have chips. They will not be at that as they will be at 130 or 180 nanometers. You don't need that kind of functionality. Even for defense applications, you generally really don't need 5 nanometers, etc. So uh, when we talk about, uh, let's say, Tejas, etc., they will not use that kind of functionality, which is a different thing. Generally, we associate military with the most cutting edge. But in this industry, military is generally use something like uh, 90 nanometers or 180 nanometers, their requirements are about reliability, not so much about speed. So this is how it looks. And yeah, uh, TSMC is a company which uh, ha has a dominant market share in the advanced uh, nodes, the 5 nanometers, etc. But as you come down, it is not so uh, uh, concentrated and there are many other players which exist. So I'll stop with this and we can discuss a lot more during the conversation. Fantastic. Thank you, Pranay, for that wonderful kickoff introduction. And, and we were wondering how we could get some of those schematics or those views in front of everybody so that you have a bit of a peg point to some of the discussion that's about to happen. Um, <clears throat> one thing that Pranay and I discussed was how do we want to run this? Initially, the thought was just uh, you know interaction with our participation. And then we said we'll put a couple of slides just to put the visuals there that people can kind of peg against. But we want to keep this highly interactive. So quick question, how many of you are geopolitics buff? OK, several hands come up. Fantastic. And if you're an expert, please raise your hand under the buff segment, too. <laughs> uh, how many of you are semiconductor folks? What's the meaning of folks? <laughs> People who possibly use semiconductors or design them. So you have an abiding interest in that. Fantastic. So as long as we have a conductor folk, and <laughs> Um, how many of you are here just because it's an interesting topic? It's, okay, fantastic. Uh, and clearly, I think from the looks of it, it's the 
the recency of the kind of conversations that have been happening around semiconductors and geopolitics that brings many of us together. So in that case, um, you might have noticed there's this wonderful book and, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. Um, the parts of it which flew over and you know, having my hairstyle allows things to bounce far more easily, but, uh, but the entire parts of it which are brilliant, I mean, especially when you went to the geopolitics of different regions, countries, I mean, it helped me internalize a lot. Why this book? What made you write this book? Yeah, so uh, both of us were working as IC design engineers earlier. And then uh, I transitioned to public policy role um, 10 years ago. So uh, semiconductors was something I was interested in and I have been working on foreign policy related issues, etc. So when in 2019, Trump, uh, President Trump back then, put the export controls on Huawei and uh, before that ZT, uh, that was the time when I started th uh, seeing things related to this domain uh, in entering into the geopolitical sphere. Right Before that, I mean, pe people even in tech didn't consider ICs to be that relevant, right? Always you would hear talk about software, etc., right? And I'm sure many people in this room, if they were not from the semiconductor industry, would not have heard about TSMC, right? I mean, why do you need to know? Because the industry just worked so well that you just got the chips when you wanted, right? So uh, the, it was a mark that the industry was going well that you didn't need to worry about the underlying companies, etc. But lo and behold, 2020 happens, you have COVID and first time there are supply chain shortages that intersects with the geopolitics going on with uh, President Trump banning uh, the uh, uh, export controls on Huawei etc. Then again it happens with respect to Russia and then Taiwan-China relations also worsen. Right? So there was this moment where okay my understanding of semiconductors and geopolitics it's perfectly uh, set for a new area which is talking about this. So that was the uh, beginning and at Takshashila we do courses on public policy. So I, were, I uh, made a module on semiconductor geopolitics and we were also writing papers on this about what India and other countries can do collaboratively in this domain. Uh, so that's why I thought it's a good point to just write it in a book form and that's how it came to be. Awesome. And um, so when you wrote this book, who did you have as an audience in mind when you were yeah. writing this? So the book is written for someone who does not have any background of semiconductors to begin with. So that was the starting point is there. We explain how the entire supply chain works um, and how the geopolitics of semiconductors has played out in the past as well. This is not the first time that we are hearing about it. So those are the angles uh, that we cover. Uh, the idea was for any person who is interested in hearing these terms and wants to make sense of it, uh, can we present a framework. Uh, uh, there are other books on this uh, topic as well. Uh, a famous book is Chip War. I'm sure many of you would have heard about it also. What I thought we should be doing, for example, that book has only two mentions of India, whereas India to me is an important part of the semiconductor supply chain as it shows there are some people in this uh, audience also who work in this. So I thought it is important to give an Indian perspective also. What is it that India has been doing whereas India failed in the past? So that's why we have a chapter on India. Uh, and our lens at looking at this is from a public policy perspective. So we try to understand why certain nation states were able to do better in this industry than others, what are the factors that go into it and we try to have a framework to look at the future, how this might pan out, what are some geopolitical instruments that you might see in this domain. So that was our idea. Fantastic. Now just a quick poll for the audience. Uh, how many of you have actually read this book, if at all you have? Nobody has. So maybe I'm the sample size of one who's read the book. Um, if somebody reads a book, and again, the, it's not so much about the book, but more about the topic, right? There was news just a couple of days ago in the, in the you know, media saying there's an X billion dollar investment coming in from one company. How do we interpret those news articles? What should we look for? What should we kind of query against such a headline? In the semiconductor space? Yeah, so 
often times you will see these news items that some company has signed an mou with another uh, government uh, agency that they will start a fab etc so i am very skeptical of that uh, because mous don't translate into uh, fabs the, the way i would interpret it is through look at that cycle which i said if something is happening on design it is more likely true because that is a comparative advantage of india already you have the necessary human capital to do things there if you are seeing announcements on the manufacturing side it be more skeptical see through the news items because that is the most capital intensive segment and doing business in india is difficult when you have to put uh, 12 billion dollars or even 5 billion dollars and uh, remember the chip that will come out if you invest that 10 billion dollars today will only be realized 4 5 years down the line so uh, an investor needs to have lot of confidence in the policy business tax trade environments of a country to be able to commit uh, for that gestation period right so that's why lots of mou signed on the manufacturing side but they are, don't realize often so we'll be more skeptical on that but on the assembly side again because it is a labor intensive stage uh, there are more positive signs so in fact uh, a us company micron which is one of the well known memory makers um, memory chip makers has committed to uh, making an assembly plant recently and that is going to happen so that's how i would arrange it look at it segment wise and be skeptical when things are happening on the fab lots of announcements get made and as you rightly said every single day there is a news item about semiconductors now uh, but uh, not all of them translate into reality fantastic so maybe uh, and i do realize you showed us some initial slides to so kind of set the context for us but if we just dive into the semiconductor world um, can you help us and and you made some remarks about say example tejas so it has 90 nanometers or 180 versus a uh, iphone which is possibly 5 can you lay that landscape for us and if so what are the opportunities for countries and including india in in that landscape what does that look like yeah so when we talk about those that chart uh, which i said uh, it is roughly talking about what is the advanced stage so as i said the smaller the number it is denoting uh, what is most advanced uh, but it does not mean that everything has to happen at the advanced stage right like uh, i showed there is a 50% market share for uh, what below uh, 28 and 45 nanometers which we saw so there is a big space for nation states or their companies to begin at a particular level which is not the most cutting edge and then slowly uh, climb the ladder of uh, getting more and more expertise and developing it further right so this is where india's opportunity uh, is as well now what has happened over the last few years is Uh, india has tried to do uh, many attempts where we wanted to start a fab etc um, we can discuss later why that didn't work but this time the government is giving upfront capital support for anyone who's interested in building a fab earlier it was not an upfront capital support it was a reimbursement model so you start it's like a pli right you start a production then you get money back now uh, why will an investor put money if you are going to start production only 5 years from now right it's too long the gestation period no one was interested this time the government is trying to uh, give money when the uh, building of that fab is taking place so th that's why there are higher chances of an investor for an investor now uh, and if you look at the history of a lot of the Uh, countries which have gotten better in the manufacturing segment it has always been a process of you start at the uh, low end you keep learning then you get more and more expertise in it you fine tune your recipe uh, and then you get better right so essentially what happens is uh, the entire game is that there is this wafer where i told you of many millions of transistors in per millimeter square the game is about optimizing the process such that you get maximum number of chips on a wafer which work accurately so that is called the yield of a chip so tsmc etc over years have developed that expertise to maximize that yield it wasn't so when they started right uh, this happened in 1980s when a lot of work started 
moving from the US to TSMC, etc. And that point of time, that segment was not the most value added seg segment. In fact, companies in US were ready to give it to the likes of TSMC in Taiwan because the value addition was really low. So they just said, you do the contract. These were all con these are all contract manufacturers. So you just make this, these chips for us. We will focus on the higher value added stuff, which was the design, right? So. TSMC, UMC, there were a lot of other companies which started at that time, got better over time and now after 30 years, they are some of the bigger players in this and that has become sort of a uh, uh, bottleneck in that supply chain because they have the recipe which no other company has because they are able to do things at 5 nanometers at the best yield possible compared to other companies, right? So that's how it goes. So you have to start somewhere develop over time. So India's opportunity again is not in, you can, it's very unlikely that likes of TSMC will come to India because every other country is wooing TSMC after the geopolitics heated up. So they are setting up uh, fab in Arizona, in Germany, in Japan and these are countries which already have some expertise of doing this. We have zero commercial uh, chip fabrication in India zero right so we are starting so probably we would start at a uh, uh, at a not not so advanced node get better at it and the cost will also be significantly lesser and then you build over time fantastic fantastic so a uh, bunch of questions kind of open up from that if you look at the, with the five nanometer or the smaller nanometers obviously sounds far more interesting and far more appealing because it's cutting edge. But also what you seem to say earlier was, for example, washing machines. You don't need something that challenging. So there is a large market, a large consumption built around more older technology, if I can call it that. Is that market still innovative? Are there new production techniques, new yield techniques, etc., being applied there? Or is that just commodity, copy-paste world? Yeah. So. A lot of it is commodity, uh, I, but there are lots of improvements which go on in terms of optimizing the process uh, and getting better at um, get, um, reducing the cycle times, etc. So that does happen. Uh, but and remember, it's when we say an Apple phone, it's not as if every chip in that itself is five nanometers. That's a processor chip that we are talking about. But an Apple phone will have several other chips which will also be at um, 180 nanometers or 90 nanometers. So there is now the big change in India also now is that downstream electronics assembly is happening in India now which didn't happen earlier. In China also the way it started was first electronics assembly started and because there was a big electronics assembly segment then you have the requirement for chips uh, and that's why the chip assembly started then after chip assembly started fab started and then they got uh, better at design as well. So they went backwards in that supply chain. Uh, so that's how um, it happened. So the, the demand will come not just from uh, washing machines etc. It will come even from the likes of Apple doing electronics assembly and others here. And a lot of that demand will not be from India because the smartphone market for example is 94% outside India. Only 6% demand comes from India. So obviously it will be for things which are made here but are largely for exports and they have to be export competitive. Amazing and, um, and uh, I'd like to open it out for questions but I'll stay on the whole uh, on the whole semiconductor path for a bit more and then we'll go to the geopolitics side but there's a question in the audience. Yeah, but, um, do you want me to ask a question now? Or after? You can ask a question now as part of the same theme if you can. I missed the very first part because I was in the other one. Maybe you should start five minutes later. Uh, so this question might be redundant for that reason. The, I'm not playing the devil's advocate, and I'm not a, a semi-contractor folk, as you put it. Um, for example, if we're talking about photovoltaics, which also use this thing, and they certainly don't use five nanometer chips. <coughs> We could be competitive in the narrow sense of the world. But on the other hand, making those chips is very energy intensive. So China subsidizes those chips essentially by subsidizing the energy. So 
I have two questions there. One is, does it make any sense for us at all to make anything more than a minimum, minimal number of such chips rather than importing them and instead take advantage of China subsidizing the cost of those things? At another level, um, you mentioned Micron Technology setting up that shop in uh, Gujarat. They are being subsidized to an enormous extent to do something that Malaysia was doing 40 years ago, 40 plus years ago. And Malaysia has not progressed up the value chain in any sense of the word, either in terms of sophistication, in terms of value, or on any other thing. The only thing is they're providing um, jobs to some hundreds of thousands of semi-skilled people. Would you like to answer those two questions on the basis of policy rather than purely technology? Yeah, uh, great point. So one thing, it's not just, I don't think energy is the big issue. Uh, the uh, issue is... I didn't uh, say it's an issue. I'm just saying that they're paying for it. Why should we pay for it? Yeah, so uh, one... The earlier when this industry sort of bifurcated and you had lots of manufacturing happening here, it was for two reasons. One, environmentally uh, it was uh, polluting in the 80s, etc. Uh, and also like the value addition was less. Over time it has gotten better. So now the environmental angle, etc. is not that big a problem. So processes have been refined, uh, etc. So that is one thing to know about. The second one um, that why uh, the uh, why can we import chips from China? Sure. So I think uh, I have made this argument also that Today, 64% of ICs that come to India are from China or Hong Kong or Macau, so largely from China. Uh, do we need to stop all of them? No. Why? Uh, it's okay if they are making it, just take advantage of it. But what I would say is required for India, and that's my preference, you need to think of in terms of vulnerabilities as well. The goal of public policy is not just in terms of uh, making something, but to reduce critical vulnerabilities as well. So if you want to make the advanced chips 20, 30 years down the line, you have to start somewhere. And one, the start would be to make uh, to learn and to create that ecosystem of how do you get a fab etc. So I don't think ever we will be in a position where we will be self-sufficient in chips. No country is self-sufficient in chips. Taiwan's biggest imports is chips even though its biggest exports is chips. Right. So uh, the aim is shouldn't be even to try that we will become self-sufficient. That's not in my understanding what the government is trying as well. The idea is to at least start somewhere in this value chain to know how this happens to reduce a critical vulnerability in this information age. That's how I would put it. So aim is not to do everything in... But semiconductors India had set up a plant 30 years ago and until that fire occurred, they were making chips. Can I if we, uh, yeah, go ahead. And there's one more question after that. We'll, uh, can you keep the question brief? Yes, the mic's coming your way. Uh, thanks for the nice uh, intro. Uh, my question is when I was passing out, I also passed out from a tech institute, one of the good tech institutes. Uh, Texas Instruments was the, you know, the go-to company, right? They used to give us uh, computers at home and all that. You can work from home even in those days. Why is it that after that uh, you know, initial Texas Instruments, do you have any hypothesis on why they didn't expand or we expanded in software, in uh, business software, but I don't see anybody in that era, right, even in 90s, who came out of Texas Instruments and actually set up more design, uh, you know, IC design or you know, microprocessor design. That never happened. Uh, you know, do you have any hypothesis on why, it, why Indian IT went into business services or not? Thank you. Okay. So, uh, 
Yeah, I'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll discuss the India history and all in more detail later. So just on that question, yeah, uh, Texas Instruments was the first MNC in Bangalore as well, 1985. Uh, I, I worked uh, at TI India for uh, seven years also. Uh, but I during my time also, I saw many people moving out and starting their own firms. But the way it was, uh, a lot of people started design services firms. So many firms provide providing, uh, uh, you, you know, capabilities for the uh, centers for MNCs here. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of time when you will have hardware products in India as well. In fact, we know of a few companies which have developed hardware products and sold, etc. But the difference is software is easy to uh, get started in India. Also, there's a it just doesn't happen because you have a great idea, right? You also need to have a venture capital ecosystem, people who understand uh, that kind of thing. Also, remember the gestation periods in this will be high, right? If, if you make a design to realize that onto the chip is three, four years of development work, then finally it goes to an OEM, you get demands, six, seven years. So the, OE, the gestation periods are larger. So in any uh, industry, in any, anywhere in the world, this will be a difference between software and hardware. So my mental model is that in hardware, we are probably 10 years behind where we are, were in software. So 10 years ago, you didn't have any Indian software products, right? Now you have, maybe you will do that in hardware also over time. But uh, that's how I would think of it. Excellent. So if I just pick on the thread that we just had now, right? That, for example, China is making certain kinds of chips in great volume and we can just consume it. Why do you want to try and reinvent the wheel or build it yourself? And to, to that, you made this wonderful point. There's no point trying to be the full stack owner. But yet, this entire theme of discussion, even in your own personal research, starts because of the geopolitical risks that emerged or supply chain risks that emerged. What does that flavor mean even to this assertion that we should just consume it because it's available? How does that play out? What if tomorrow China is banned or goes into the deny list for whatever reason? How does that work? Yeah. So, uh, that's why I have a problem with the framing of this as a chip war. I don't think there is a war happening in the sense that uh, between US and China, the restrictions currently apply only to the most advanced chips that they think might be used for military or artificial intelligence related I mean, core model development kind of uh, chips that are required. But other than that, US and China trade is going on as usual uh, because no US companies can survive without uh, the demand from China and Chinese companies will also have to finally supply to the US. So in that sense, uh, what is right now happening is probably an aggressive tech competition, not so much about uh, a war in, in, the, in that sense, right? Uh, so the geopolitics of it, I think the crucial element of this is the Taiwan angle. It's because Taiwan is where we saw, I mean, more than 80% of the most advanced uh, chips are made there. Now, what happens if China-Taiwan relations were to worsen? What happens if China were to invade Taiwan? Not for semiconductors, I don't think they'll invade for this, but they have other reasons, political reasons why that might happen. So if that happens, what are the consequences for, I mean, you will see, a lot of inflation, you will see delays, you can, this, whatever happened during the COVID period on the semiconductor side, right, you can amplify it many times uh, and that will be the effect. Also, remember, even for some of the chips that the US defense uses, for example, are made, finally manufactured in Taiwan. So that, that is another risk that they foresee. So these, the Taiwan and worsening China-Taiwan relations are a big geopolitical driver for what is happening. So that's the one uh, angle. Also, um, and the US-China tech competition. There is other thing which is happening on the geoeconomic side, right? The entire, the experience with uh, COVID-19 and shortages, uh, the lesson that uh, many companies learned is that uh, 
this supply chain is wonderful when it works well but if there are certain things that go wrong there is no angle of resilience in the supply chain uh, if you will so the idea is your in entire of the the segments that we talked about there are one or two companies which are at the cutting edge what happens if those companies are not able to do what they do for multiple reasons right what if there's a drought in taiwan which is a realistic possibility what if there's an earthquake in japan what if asml uh, has a board fight and they are not able to produce what they do right all these are realistic risks that many companies and countries want to figure out and that's the geo economic imperative for doing something in this and finally there's a technological imperative right so um, you have the fact that your when you talk about ai chips or others a lot of the development in other technologies will be driven by new architectures that are made uh, in the semiconductor industry right so what is the replacement for gpus how do you make better gpus how do you have tpus and so on and so forth so for all that again you require this so that's why my assessment is that this is sort of a meta critical uh, moment because these three streams have merged today there is geopolitics there is geo economic imperative and there is a technological imperative and that's why we are hearing a lot more of it many nation states want to uh, do something in this even though not the entire value chain but try to identify which are the segments where they can get better at and improve and build strength there Awesome. For the sake of completeness, can I request you to take a small sidebar, explain why AI and specifically Gen AI large language models today are so reliant on GPUs and therefore the very dense chips. So what is that correlation and therefore what is that war? If you can just take two minutes to. Yeah. Okay. So essentially. Um, the new llm models etc that are you using you have to do large scale matrix multiplication and uh, those kinds of operations a lot of those operations require parallelism so you want to be able to do multi a lot of those convolutions and computations in a parallel manner you don't need to do it sequentially now when you use a general purpose uh, chip uh, right that will do things sequentially so you will not be able to achieve the kind of uh, the the training speeds that you require right these training runs are very costly energy intensive require a lot of time so you want to do that with as more parallelism the better it is so gpus were not made for ai loads they were obviously made to play games but game uh, development and game playing has some of the same requirements that you require now in ai which is parallelism to reduce latency to develop uh, a, a gaming experience which allows you to not see any delays right it is as instantaneous as you can make it to be so when uh, ai development etc happened out of all the possible architectures gpu is one architecture which worked really well for this parallel processing and that's why it is a big deal now there are other architectures also you can do that on fpgas uh, field programmable gate arrays you can do that on what google is trying to build custom chips for uh, their ai loads etc so you will see competition happening nvidia's uh, gpus are uh, ruling the roost now but not for uh, always there are lot of competition might come up in the next few years on that so then if we kind of extend that conversation out to the geopolitics piece and president trump and the the kind of the blocks of the bands they did on huawei zte all those companies what were they trying to achieve yeah so uh, one of the reasons for this ban was that us china confrontation was happening now us is seeing china as a structural adversary that you need to counter china's growth in uh, in some way or the other now in what domains can it happen um, large scale war etc is unlikely both are nuclear powers won't have that very unlikely uh, second is can you do that on the trade front that also they started but the industries are so intertwined not just in semiconductors etc but china and us are so interdependent on each other that any large scale ban by us on imports of uh, china hurts us consumers also so what is the domain which is left where this competition can take place in 
many times in the past as well technology becomes this domain where that contestation takes place also because the backstops are not very well known like uh, now companies will figure out that there are costs to be borne and there are subsidies that you have to do in order to uh, absorb the costs of this breakage that they are attempting now but uh, be that as it may the backstops are so uh, not well known so technology becomes a domain where this contestation happens within technology if you look at china's technology stack semiconductors are a weakness uh, area of weakness compared to many other things that they have gotten at because they are they have not produced the most advanced chips uh, even on the design front there is a 2014 paper which tried to look at the capabilities of chinese design engineers and indian design engineers and the paper finds indian design engineers were more capable uh, but of course with time china has caught up doing much better so if you look at the china's tech stack the one weakness which it exists is in semiconductors Whereas US is exactly the opposite, it is a dominant player in many of the segments that we are talking about. So as a rule of strategy, you would try to attack your adversary in a domain where you are strong, they are weak. So that's why you started seeing things in semiconductors before many other technologies is how I understand it. Excellent. So I'm going to fork this thought now into two parts. One part is therefore China is supposed to be this manufacturing superpower, and it is for the amount it manufactures. You give them anything, they figure out how to kind of reverse engineer it and then make tons of copies. So what stops them from achieving that? And I think you alluded to a bit of it about design engineers, capabilities, etc. And you seem to say they seem to catch up. But what's holding them back from reverse engineering maybe that uh, ASML you know, $200 million machine? That's one line of question. The other line of question that comes up is, you in the book, you also talk about the European automakers in, in the early part of the pandemic who are running short of chips and therefore was stymied in their ability to roll their cars out. And so they're sort of shipping cars without features on. How do they, what are both these and how do they intersect or are they very different? Uh, yeah. So on the export uh, controls front, right? So if the industry would have worked the way it was four years ago, Chinese capabilities in this domain would have improved much faster than they are. But as we saw, none of the things, even TSMC doesn't do everything on its own, right? There is a machine which will still come from ASML. Uh, there will be the specialized gases, etc., which are required for this. The purity levels are insane, right? For being able to produce things that small. Those come from Japan. Uh, much of the demand comes from US. So interdependence and being the ability to work with all these players is very important uh, to gain capability build on it. So now with these export controls, uh, China is not able to get some of that uh, international collaboration which was happening seamlessly earlier. So that is the major reason. That was also the aim why these export controls were sort of put in that at the cutting edge, the costs that Chinese companies will incur for making something have increased significantly. Uh, and uh, they probably can catch up, but it will take a lot more time because you need access to some of these things from uh, other companies and other countries. So uh, in my assessment, probably they have been put back by another five, six years at least by these export controls. Now they will try to figure out alternatives to ASML, etc. A lot of investment that the government will put in. But the big damage is that because of these restrictions, the Chinese exports of chips has significantly gone down, right? Because uh, many other nation states are also circumspect that what are these chips? There is also a angle of hardware espionage. Is that happening? There have been some cases in the US that there were some chips, some advanced chips where there was hardware espionage going on. Uh, so all that with the geopoliticization of this domain means that whatever China is doing, it is not able to export these chips, which it could do uh, seamlessly earlier. So that's the big uh, change that has happened now. 
Awesome. Do you want to talk about the European car companies and their struggles with cars in the early part of the pandemic? So it's the lack of chips. That story, do you want to kind of relay now? Yeah, so uh, the, uh, the problem there was, again, a lot of the car companies in Europe has also moved through a similar stage that they don't do a lot of manufacturing there uh, on the chips front. A lot of the chips are manufactured in Taiwan or China. Uh, so when this uh, COVID-19 happened, obviously demands for cars went down. So a lot of the car companies in Europe, uh, they didn't place orders with these contract manufacturers. And simultaneously, you, everyone of us was working at home, on Zoom. Uh, so the demand for the chips that are used in data centers and laptops skyrocketed. So all the uh, manufacturing slots that were previously occupied by these uh, European car makers were now occupied by the laptop uh, makers and, uh, and all those companies, right? So when the demand again started picking up and COVID started receding, these automakers couldn't find the free slots which were available to them later. So that's why you had this uh, period when they weren't able to ship cars with certain features. But that is gone, that's behind us. And in fact, in the next one or two years, you will see that there will be excess fab capacity because of all this geopoliticization, every nation state, I mean, every nation state is interested, has some capability in this domain, it has put some money in, they are trying to build some fabs. So that problem is no longer uh, a big issue right now. Awesome. In the, in the early part of the book, you talk about fabs and spare capacity of fabs, which then drives a whole amount of innovation and contract manufacturing, which then opens up entire new areas for chip manufacture. Do you want to talk about that and maybe what it can open in the coming years because of this additional capacity that's there? Yeah. So. Um, the way uh, I put it is, this industry is, uh, I mean, economists should be very happy with this industry because it is an example of how comparative advantage-based specialization happens in reality on ground. So uh, the way uh, it happened earlier was, first, all these processes which I told were ha done by a single company. One company used to do all that, uh, no problem. They used to get the chips out, manufacture it, assemble it as well. But in order to pack in more transistors, uh, uh, you need to do capital investment, get better at it. That capital costs kept rising, right? So uh, people have heard about Moore's law. Moore's law is often stated, uh, it was just an intuition, which we call it as a law now. But the intuition was that the number of uh, transistors in a, in the same area in a chip will double every 18 months or so. It essentially means you will achieve more power, more capability within that time. But there's a flip side to Moore's law, which is called Rock's law. Rock's law states that the capital cost of, uh, capital cost of starting a fab also doubles every four years. So as you started to make smaller transistors, etc., uh, you needed to invest a lot more capital. So many, many companies couldn't do that. Right? I, in fact, that is one reason why Indian efforts failed. We can discuss that later. So the idea was very few companies can keep putting double their capital cost every four years. So the new a new model emerged where companies thought that I can't put in this much capital every four years. What if some other company were to just do this for all design firms at once? That was the pitch of Morris Chang, who was a Texas Instruments employee who went on to found TSMC. So their pitch was simple. We will never compete with a design firm. Uh, whether you are AMD, whether you are uh, Broadcom, doesn't matter. You just give us your designs, we will manufacture it for you. So we'll be just the contract manufacturers. So they build the excess capacity, right? So they build this capacity, which the pitch was simple. You uh, give us uh, uh, the uh, designs and we'll m make it, right? Remember when, if you didn't have something like TSMC, first of all, the capital costs are high and you have to keep your fab busy with 
chips all the time to recoup recoup that money right and you will do that only if you have sufficient demand not one company will not have sufficient demand to absorb that capital cost but now you have a contract manufacturer who can absorb demand from 30 companies and then uh, keep the fab busy at all times and run it at revenue right so that is the innovation process innovation which happened and that's why a lot of companies in US and Europe were very happy because you could have new startups which didn't have to worry about billions of dollars of investment to start a fab. You could just start with a bunch of engineers, a design venture capital and start with a good design and offshore this work of contract manufacturing to someone in East Asia. So that was the innovation which happened. Now uh, over time the value addition in the manufacturing segment has increased a lot and that's why it has become uh, something which many companies are interested in. In fact, in Intel has also started an Intel Foundry Services unit. So now they are doing, trying to do the same thing that TSMC is doing. So give their fab capacity to other players uh, and like they are trying to become a contract manufacturer as well. So you might see a lot of that happening. Uh, for the same reason, costs are rising, capital costs are high, they are prohibitive. So you want to be able to utilize whatever capacity you have to the fullest extent. Amazing. And I'll ask one more question and then open it up again for some more questions from the audience. Um, now going back to the Cold War era, I mean, before I go there, you spoke about China, you spoke about the denial of market, I mean access to market uh, to China, which you said will set them back by several years. In the book, there's this lovely piece about in the Cold War, the Soviet Union, they set up a city called Zelenograd, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, and, and then you speak about how they set that city up, but then yet why it did not succeed. And maybe there's lots of stories there about, from there, uh, analogies from there into China and even India. Do you want to speak about that? Yeah, so that's a fascinating story. So there have been many government run attempts to start fabs. Uh, as you rightly said, the story of China, India and USSR are similar in that respect and all three failed. Uh, in this domain, uh, including in China. And in fact, the later success that they have had is very recent, 1996, when someone just copies the model that Morris Chang did, sets up TSMC. In fact, another Texas Instruments employee comes back to China and starts SMIC, which is their national champion on manufacturing. So all that happened later, 1990s, and happened through private capital with some subsidies. But government-run attempts have been there in USSR, uh, in China, and even in India since late 50s and 1960s, but all of all three of them failed. My, my Our assessment in this is there are three reasons. All of them follow a similar trajectory. Government run attempts first start uh, and uh, they achieve some initial success. But over time, just think of it from a rock slow perspective, right? You need to put in constant capital to be able to be competitive at the leading edge. Also, to be able to uh, recoup that uh, capital cost, you need to supply to a large number of players, right? You can't supply, the government demand for these are very small. So even the USSR government with its mighty military, the demand that the mighty military will generate for chips will be very small. Uh, you, you need a commercial buyer across the world to be able to do that. But what's the incentive for a government company to do that, right? So essentially all these companies started in all three countries, did a few things, India and China. Uh, in fact, China made its IC before Taiwan, first IC. So all of them start uh, first and then they end up being small suppliers to the government companies itself. The second thing which happens in these ecosystems is that in government, if you have two government firms which are manufacturing chips, which was the case in India, competition is uh, and is seen negatively because the same government money is going into two firms. So they said, why are you putting uh, two firms are doing this chip manufacturing? So in fact, they got BEL, Bharat Electronics Limited, to stop making chips and said SCL, uh, which is a semiconductor complex limited. Uh, to say you make chips and you don't make chips. So competition was seen negatively, whereas in uh, in Taiwan also uh, you had multiple players 
trying to build this not just one player so that was the second reason the third reason and this applies more to india than in ussr a lot of these uh, chip manufacturing requires a lot of imports right machines need to be imported like i told you taiwan's biggest imports is also chips in that era when we were before liberalization foreign exchange was constrained so any imports were seen negatively uh, so there were long delays for these firms to import um, equipment so by the time they got approvals and the money to import it the many of their buyers itself were buying those chips made elsewhere and not here so that was the story which repeats starts in ussr repeats in china and india so similar thing interesting and you see a variation of this play out now that china is restricted on some of those very dense chips the 5 nanometer etc you you suspect that's going to happen Uh, but they are not doing this from by government run companies now so right the, there's a difference that a lot of things are happening now outside the government of course there is subsidy every gov every uh, fab which has been set up in the world has government subsidy so there's some government subsidy angle involved in all of them uh, but these firms are not being run by the government whereas earlier they were so their focus was pretty much on okay space and defense sector these are the ones that i want to supply to i don't want to compete in the exports market that is not what is happening now awesome and there's a question from the gentleman here Yeah, the last discussion was very interesting. In fact, uh, you said you brought out why India has attempted to make uh, semiconductor fabrication here did not work. You brought it out very clearly. What has changed? You think commercial guys are going to produce lot of things? Take for example, the I am talking about a slightly different semiconductor now, gallium nitride. Gallium nitride based. transistors are used for rf okay and also for uh, making uh, uh, inverters and converters down below if you look at the market for this in india there is not a single company who has designed the ram the radio assistant not a single company who has made even a charging unit design i'm talking about design so if you, if some fab in india makes this Let's let's look at the lower end, the low frequency switches, uh, of which there's a lot of benefit if you use guy. Nobody will buy it. So the commercial, at least if you make something for defense and space, you can. There will be a, definitely a captive market. But whereas commercial, nobody will buy it because nobody invests in R and D. Nobody makes a circuit. You so, open any system; it's all imported. So, uh, second thing on the same line: assume that you are going to make a processor like Intel's some uh, some processor that you want to make. It is not just hardware. The amount of software support they provide, and the amount of man years and man money—I don't know what to call it—millions uh, of dollars they spend in providing those support services. Also need to be produced here. So when will you ever catch up? So I, I think the system in India is not pragmatic. It is just, uh, as you rightly said, uh, like like the fabrication you brought out in Malaysia has not gone anywhere by packaging something. We we will end up in such a situation and we lose lot of money. So hmm. let's look at it more pragmatically. I'll read your book and we'll discuss. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you got one uh, reader. Uh, yeah, I am not that uh, pessimistic. Actually, uh, there are many things which have changed. Uh, I'll restrict myself to the fab uh, part. Uh, one, uh, as I said, earlier attempts. One, so I have divided India's attempts into three versions. One was by the government for the government. I explained. why that model didn't work the second more time was attempted between 2005 and uh, there were three attempts made in 2005 6 amd wanted to start a fab city in hyderabad then there was uh, one more attempt in 2014 15 where there were two players a lot of that uh, 
didn't work because there were really concerns on run, doing business Re retrospective taxation happened in uh, that period so all that there was a fear that if i'm going to invest money in something which takes 5 years for first product to come i'm not going to put money in it. this time the change is uh, so several changes right one as i said downstream electronics assembly is happening in india which didn't happen in even until 2014 15 at a commercial scale right apple wants to make 15% of its iphone production in india by 2050 correct no that's what i'm saying yeah yeah so that's what once you start doing that downstream one you will uh, require demand from the upstream one that didn't happen earlier so the demand uh, is is rising uh, one the second uh, big difference as i said is the policies right now are we have backing capital costs of uh, so there's a 50 50% capital share so if a fab wants to invest 1 rupee while the government is put building it the government is willing to back it by another rupee right so that was not the case in any of the schemes earlier so that is another change the third big change i think is something we uh, cite politics of innovation literature called creative insecurity the idea is earlier r and d etc are 21st in our list of 20 priorities right because we have other things to do but because even from a national security perspective etc for india indian government the focus has changed from pakistan to china over the last 8 7 years so because of that a lot of and we know that uh, china is a bigger technological power than india is a lot of focus now is on how can we catch up to that which didn't exist 5 6 years ago 5 6 years ago we thought if we can be better than pakistan it's fine right so now that is a big difference so you can see a lot of focus on whether it is the national research foundation there is a recent budget putting in money for private r&d now we can argue on whether that is the right policy instrument but you can clearly see there is a focus on that not because of one particular government or the other but the fact that we realize that china is the bigger adversary that we need to catch up to so that is a difference and third as as i said it is a process of learning upgradation which takes time uh, we would have said the exactly the same thing about indian software uh, 15 years ago but you have indian software products which are being used globally i think that's something similar you might see in hardware as well can can i take that might thread a bit further likely. if did you use the word might or likely quite likely might i don't know is it might Okay. Uh, if I take that thought slightly further, essential to that is a notion that there's a very high end entry barrier to entering some of these areas. Like, um, and and the point we made is even if you take something like an inverter, there's no chips of any form. There's no even minor pieces which are completely designed locally. But yet, if I look at say maps, which is not a low entry barrier. topic either but yet you have navic chips which are now becoming more widely consumed you have uh, local maps and not google maps which seem to be pretty good and most truckers seem to use it how does that play out how did that happen or what are the learnings from that kind of a build out which will likely inform the semiconductor area yeah so um, let me explain the indian ecosystem first that we it will happen. so when i said zero commercial chips are manufactured here right it doesn't mean design doesn't happen design happens first of all uh, there is a top 10 semiconductor fabless companies by revenue all have their design centers in this city right some of them have been here for um, 35 38 years with 1985 uh, texas instruments so obviously when you have 38 years of capability building you will have uh, things which start in locally as well so there are many of the alumni of ti intel and other firms who have started their own design firms they first started with design services because again it is easy uh, the entry barriers point which you mentioned is least in services so they basically provide people who know chip design to these firms like intel uh, and others so a lot of the first companies which came around 2000s and that period were the services firms now over the last 5 uh, 6 years a lot of product firms are uh, 
also have also started coming not like in the software space there are many but they have uh, started some of them have been acquired by rnsas and other uh, multinationals as well so that process is happening uh, and it's about how fast uh, that takes place. So if there's a lot of attention on government policy for the fabs, but if you look at government policies, it's not just for fabs. It is also for design. It is also for assembly. It is also for gallium nitride compound semiconductor chips. So the policy right now is across the entire ecosystem, including uh, design. So uh, that is what is happening uh, now. and. Yeah, maybe you will see some of the things happening out of it. Excellent. And, and sir, if you can hold questions for just a couple more minutes, looking at the time, we have about 25 minutes left. Do we want to spend some time on the global landscape of semiconductors? So the book is obviously very exhaustive on that. Talks of Europe, talks of East Asia, talks of some of the key countries there. How do they interplay? Who does what? Do you want to spend about five, 10 minutes talking about that? And after that, we'll open it out entirely to questions. Yeah. So um, globally, uh, like I explained, a lot of things, that, I mean, OK, let me take some key features of this. So one, every country which has built a semiconductor industry has built it with some form of technology transfer from the US. That's uh, one point uh, we need to realize, including China. Um, and a, a lot of it happens through technology transfer. Initially, you learn uh, you're doing a contract manufacturing from someone. Then you get better over time. And technology upgradation and learning happens. So in this, the global landscape currently is that Europe is very good at the research segment of that supply chain, which I mentioned. So there are um, there's IMEC in Belgium, which does a lot of uh, great research. And then there is also, um, in the manufacturing segment, the machines which go um, photolithography machines the, for the most cutting edge, um, they are called extreme ultraviolet photolithography. Those kind of machines are made by another firm, uh, ASML, which we discussed in the Netherlands. So that's how Europe is placed. There is some manufacturing capability at the trailing edge nodes, but not nothing significant at the advanced nodes. And now they are trying to get the likes of TSMC to uh, set up shop here. Again, big, huge subsidies by the government and uh, European Union to get them to set up shop there. So that US is a dominant player in most areas of this supply chain, apart from the advanced fabrication uh, segment. Okay. Uh, other than that, so the software which goes into making these chips, EDA tools, there are three main companies. All three of them have their main center in US, right? So they have put export controls on China on those as well. So essentially, they have multiple leverage points which they can block. And that has happened in the case of China. Then um, intellectual property, which we talked about, some of these uh, chips, um, like for example, you have a blueprint for, in your phone, the blueprint is not for, from an Intel uh, processor, uh, of an Intel processor, but ARM, which is a UK based company. So some intellectual properties are again in EU, they do very well in that segment, uh, uh, design and research segment. Uh, a lot of work on which we discussed about manufacturing shifted to Taiwan. So um, Taiwan and I, I mean, even uh, we were talking about Malaysia, Singapore, they are doing reasonably well on the assembly part. So uh, I would say they are they have done better on that in than India. And uh, so that also happens. Um, and then you have South Korea is again a big player. Japan does very well in the gases and specialized materials which are required that comes from Japan. Um, and yeah, China is trying to get better at many of these segments <coughs> internally. They are, uh, they also have good design firms now, which have been built up over time. But all this happens through a uh, lot of international collaboration. As I said, it has been one key uh, element. So I like this phrase, which um, Vilishi uh, uses to describe this. It's like a transcontinental relay race with hidden hurdles. So there, it's uh, you are passing the baton uh, from one company to the other, and there are sometimes hidden hurdles, as you saw. Uh, and those, uh, when they rise, we talk about it. 
Are there any groups or cartelization of some of these countries, or is it all just open free? Yeah, so now, uh, that's a great question. There is, now because of this uh, becoming a point of geopolitical contestation, there is a cartelization in the sense that there are uh, multilateral controls which are being put in, right? So for example, there is a, uh, once US put these export controls on China, uh, obviously there are alternate some alternate suppliers so they could have said you know ASML could have still supplied to China so US had to also get Netherlands on board US also had to get Japan on board and US also had to get South Korea on board so there is a lot of that game happening where alliances are being formed on this so there is a chip for alliance between Taiwan uh, South Korea uh, Japan and US, which is trying to see if things can be restricted to China and so China doesn't have any great partners in this domain. Uh, so again, that's one of the weaknesses of their ecosystem. But you are seeing at the at least at the most cutting edge, there is some bifurcation happening, some quote unquote decoupling happening where uh, US is rallying its allies to deny certain things at the cutting edge to China whereas uh, China is then trying to do things on its own or do some reverse engineering, do some stealing, that uh, some industrial espionage, get Taiwanese engineers, poach some of them here uh, to China. All that is at play as we speak. You spoke about EDA software being denied. Are there alternates to that, or is that also, is that quite a steep entry barrier? Yeah, there is a steep entry barrier because to develop that software, you need to work closely with the fabs because you need to develop libraries which characterize how a particular um, transistor works, right? That's a lot of work, effort, research on trying to model it perfectly in software. And that happens because when these software firms work closely with fabs. So a fab cannot work with many companies at once. Uh, you need, again, a lot of uh, R&D there. So it's difficult. Uh, there are new interesting things happening, like there are some open source alternatives which are coming. That is a promising area. In fact, DARPA is funding open source projects which can make the cycle of producing a chip very fast, remove the human out of the design uh, of the cycle as well. A lot of those are happening, but they are not at the cutting edge. Like if you want to make a 5 nanometer, 10 nanometer chip, you can't use an open source alternative. But at the lower trailing edge, maybe in you know a few years down the line, you might not require the most cutting edge EDA tools. An open source alternative is fine. So again, open source hardware is... Uh, catching up, lot of new things are happening there. Even for core intellectual property, uh, which I said, uh, intellectual property bits, there are uh, alternatives which are coming from open source. So you might see that uh, being one way to counter this monopoly or cartelization. And for somebody in the audience who's not um, seen or heard of what an EDA actually does, can you just kind of briefly describe it? Yeah, so EDA is Electronic Design Automation. As the name suggests, uh, you have to have millions of transistors in a small area. So you essentially use software to get things done, various things. So where, where the ch uh, transistor should be placed, uh, what uh, and to model how the delays between them will be. All those are done in software called EDA. Um, there are lots of things which happen, verification, placement, design, architecture level work, connecting, all that happens through software. It happens on computers, it happens in Bangalore, probably one of the, uh, so all the design people will use these tools to make the chip. And what is stacking? And with that, my last question. Stacking? Stacking, you speak of stacking, is the next dimension in chip manufacture, chip design. Oh yeah, 3D stacking. So, uh, so again, let's go back to the overall idea of Moore's law, right? Moore's law, we said, it was an intuition in 1965 that the number of transistors will double every 18 months. It was just an uh, observation based on what was happening at that time. How has it been kept true until now, right? How has we followed? There are a lot of process innovation, economic innovation, this entire supply chain moving, comparative advantage-based specialization has been necessary to keep Moore's law alive. 
so what happens is earlier a lot of the magic used to happen in the design stage then to keep the moore's law alive to get better chips the magic moved to the fabrication point right so they figured out how to make transistors smaller the v, how the transistor was shaped itself changed there was a lot of innovation in that that's why value addition there increased now the next stage of innovation is happening in the third a segment which is assembly test and packaging so a lot of innovation is happening there to keep this uh, march towards the moore's law alive and a lot of things are happening there such that uh, you are uh, you are really hitting the lim uh, limits of physics because now the transistors are so small that the channel etc is just a few atoms so how far down can you go in uh, just making a transistor smaller from 5 nanometers to 2 nanometers and the gains that you get from these is also reducing you have lot of leakages and other problems so then magic is now happening into how can you package chips better there are some things called chiplets which are used in advanced packaging so you make smaller chips all around and then uh, package them together so a lot of innovation is now happening on the packaging side uh, and that's also something that us is investing in uh, china is investing in etc so, so fantastic and thank you very much audience questions the lady at the far end start with the lady thank you thank you uh, my question is around the hidden hurdles that you mentioned before right what are some of the choke points you're seeing is it that asml and lam cannot come up with equipment to uh, keep up with the pace of innovation for example and what are some of the challenges you're seeing i mean it's a known fact that fabs are consume more energy than a refinery in terms of water and power is that potentially a challenge so just what are choke points and challenges you see across the ecosystem and supply chain i think l largely the choke points are geopolitical in nature uh, and uh, also the fact that you have one company which is at the cutting edge so that's the geo economic choke point water and uh, electricity are to me are not the big choke points uh, i mean uh, I, i often hear this that how can india make a fab when we don't have water and electricity problems you don't have to solve water and electricity problems of india to make one fab right you need to provide water and electricity in one place which you can i mean india runs space programs nuclear programs we can also do a fab uh, which is not at the most cutting edge but you can start somewhere so the choke points really are uh, these uh, companies which are um, like eda tools again three companies so if you can control those three companies, companies you can deny it to another adversary right uh, a, the most uh, cutting edge lithography machine one company so again if you control that you can uh, deny it to a potential adversary um, yeah even the specialized gases again largely coming in from japan a few uh, known companies if you can control them then it will be a problem so it exists because uh, there are very few companies which are really great at the cutting edge uh, and that's the real choke point in my view thank you jamna if you can keep your questions really short and brief thank you yeah i'm audible yeah uh, we uh, we can keep importing and try new design but i what i feel is if there is a is there a need for a paradigm shift because uh, if we uh, completely or you solve major the majority of the problem in energy problems in india through nuclear energy commercial nuclear energy production we can use the same nuclear energy to produce the chips why are we going in that way i mean i don't know if there is anything in the government any scientist or any anybody in the government who they were thinking of actual production because there, there was a study i think I, i'm not sure it's finalized or something but there was uh, enough uh, statistical data so, so it was surface level Uh, and it was endorsed by scientists some scientist, i don't remember the scientist that we have enough nuclear energy to sustain everything in the whole world for tens of thousands of years but we are not seeing it right because we need a poker run today yeah okay we don't need, uh, 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 i think nuclear energy is a wicked problem in many countries uh, I, i agree with you it will help in a lot of ways but uh, it is a wicked problem in uh, many countries maybe if you have smr small modular reactors you will see another phase where uh, nation states 
invest a lot in building nuclear energy capability but it is not otherwise even if you look at the construction costs in us etc are really huge so when you produce that one unit of energy from nuclear you are not competitive with respect to some of the renewables now or uh, some of the even through coal so the problem is that uh, the technology that you are using for nuclear is not cost competitive anymore unless you have smrs and other alternatives which uh, people are working on then probably yes but otherwise realistically nuclear as a big component of the energy mix is not happening in any country including india question here <clears throat> sir thank you you have, you have brought out the complexity of the semiconductor of the chip technology is very well difficult to decide which is more complex the geopolitics or the technology let's take both of them on but one impression which is conveyed across the board not necessarily not necessarily in your book is that uh, if those chips with uh, 5 nanometer or 7 nanometer or 10 nanometer chips are not available the life will be very much handicapped that your economy will crash your applications will go and so on that's a very i am wondering i'm just wondering is that a self justifying assumption which is being propagated by the industry the reason i ask you is i actually i worked in the aerospace uh, domain uh, in the drdo earlier than that i actually in drdo i worked in the india's first solid state devices lab so i have some continuity in that but uh, one guy asked me this question that saying that uh, which is the most complicated uh, aerospace uh, achievement which is made by mankind think about all that but actually the the moon landing by armstrong neil armstrong is probably everybody would agree mm. go land come back deliver samples so this had been done those 1969 if you can be to the point of the question so we get a few more opportunities no, give it away right now. no but if you have a question please do ask it quickly thank you no i haven't completed that. so uh, but the thing is as you know the chip was in one day the microchip as we know very very large super large scale integration and so on didn't take place and uh, what is i mean i'm just giving it as an example to say today will life carry on i'm sure the automobile industry will be struck very seriously probably all other transportations many many things will be struck if we don't have access to uh, uh, 5 nanometer technology so what should we do yeah if i understood the question correctly it is what will, what will be the implications if there are no 5 nanometer chips right is that no, given the fact that you could go to the moon pick up sample come back and deliver it at a time when the chips didn't exist oh no chips were used in the apollo mission no what was it they were or our ancestors yeah Is so chips a, but uh, uh, ics of course ics that's what we are talking about yeah uh, they were uh, used in uh, the apollo mission in fact one of the biggest orders for ics uh, was from the nasa program uh, so uh, they were uh, used back then of course they were not 5 nanometers they were the cutting edge which was uh, required there so if your if yeah if your question is can we do things with, without 5 uh, nanometers uh, so the technology part has also moved right like for example if you want to do things related to ai or ai loads then you will need 5 nanometers to uh, achieve the functionalities that you want today the complexity of today's uh, loads on software etc have also increased many fold from that time and in fact if you were to make uh, uh, you, there is also trade off between safety and between uh, uh, accuracy uh, right so right now if you are going to attempt the same thing that you did in 1969 you are going to require many cutting edge 
chips because you, your tolerance for safety is much, much lesser, right? You want to be ensure 100% that no damage happens. So you will need, you will need chips. With, the, with an eye on time, if you're not, uh, last two questions. Yeah, yours I, and I, I, was, I was curious, you know, because I came late. I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the earlier part of the lecture. But basically what I could get was that the semiconductor industry itself is highly monopolistic industry. It's only very few monopolies, particularly including the uh, software part. They're saying the only one firm which has the software to develop the uh, PLSI designing. There's only a one firm which has the um, you know the machines to be used by foundries uh, for manufacture of chips. There's only one firm or maybe one country, say Japan, for some of the gases which are used. So what I'm finding out is understanding is that these are monopolistic industries, highly monopolistic, uh, localized, which have access to the technology. They are sitting over the technology. They don't share it with anybody else. There are barriers to technology transfer. And uh, the other countries, like country like India, which has uh, some capacity in terms of VLSI chip designing, but almost a very little capacity today of manufacturing they try to enter, they have to break these monopolies or try to get access to these monopolistic tendencies. Apart from India, which is a, a quite a, a big country today, it's not a small country. China has been able to develop this, despite the monopolistic tendencies of, uh, you are saying Netherlands, or you are saying about US, or you are saying about uh, Japan. They still have a very robust uh, chip manufacturing company, and Taiwan, which is a comparatively a small country, that has been able to develop these technologies and uh, create this, these in centers. So, what exactly is the choke point for India to go ahead? If it is capital, no, probably the government is prepared to spend 50% of the capital cost in terms of investment. What exactly is the thing which is lacking in India to, for which we, which we can't develop this industry fast now? Yeah, uh, so I would, more than monopoly, I call it market dominance. There is, uh, and not all dominance is abuse of the market uh, dominance. Uh, so there is uh, do, uh, dominance because if the capital costs required are high to develop that R&D expertise is high. So at the cutting edge, there are these restrictions. But there are many other players in each of these segments at the uh, at the not so cutting edge. The second thing, as I said, open source alternatives are now, uh, uh, now being explored on by many countries, including India, US. In fact, a lot of Chinese development on uh, processor alternatives to ARM is something called RISC-V. It's a, a project which came out of UC Berkeley, I think. And a lot of the companies which are working to productize that uh, those kinds of processes are Chinese companies. India is also one of the f founding members of this alliance. Then there are a lot of companies which are trying to build in India as well. So open source will probably be one way uh, to go ahead. And uh, China or Taiwan haven't broken these uh, market dominance at all. That's why you are seeing China being uh, uh, facing this because it also relies on uh, uh, international collaboration and access to all these. Even Taiwan realizes. That's why my, one of the things that people say if China were to invade Taiwan, uh, what will happen to the semiconductor industry? And my answer to them is that even if they were to invade, they'll find TSMC which is not effective at all because the TSMC controlled by China will not have access to the ASML machines from Netherlands and the specialized gases from Japan. So it, it will be perfectly useless with them even though the machines exist and the human capital will probably move to the US et cetera as well. So Excellent. And the last question, please. Cool. Yeah, thanks for the talk and you know, um, all of your exposition it has been very insightful. Um, a common theme I'm picking up from the wizened old um, semiconductor folk, as you lot like to call yourselves, um, is why should India do this if others have tried and failed, uh, which is at best short-sighted and at worst it is isolationist. Um, India doesn't need to have everything in place, all the steps in place, all the materials in place, all the processes in place to achieve uh, semiconductor supremacy in this region. I'm sure there are regional uh, powerhouses of expertise and experience which we can leverage and if we resign ourselves to thinking that we need to have all of these things in place, uh, I think that's just looking at it incredibly wrong, especially after you know holding the G20 presidency last year. 
so yeah what do you what do you think about that i think my understanding from reading all government policies is that they understand this uh, uh, i think both the meeting Mini ministers are, have done chip design right so so they understand this broadly that uh, you can't do everything in the supply chain and you can't be self sufficient in chips i think uh, that is thing but the idea is what do you do next right so my, from my uh, understanding india's policies have three goals one is to build on your comparative advantage which is design right so how quickly can you get people uh, 20% of the design workforce in the world is in india right so how quickly can you get some of these people to start indian product companies etc so that is one segment build on comparative advantage second goal is to reduce vulnerabilities and that's where the idea of building fab uh, at least one fab to get started comes in right uh, that that is the second and the third uh, goal in my understanding is to reduce dependence specifically on china because it is a geopolitical adversary the priority is the government has put in from my assessment is that first priority is uh, reduce dependence on china second is to reduce vulnerability third is to build comparative advantage my view is it should be exactly the opposite that uh, okay some of the things that we are importing from china are not uh, mission critical they are low end chips it's okay to import we don't need to put money into building a display fab for example why there are alternatives to display fabs if china is not did you saw display fab shortages during covid there was no uh, shortages of that because there are alternative suppliers you will get that from uh, others so focus on building comparative strength so we should do a lot more in design understand why design firms not many more design firms are coming up what can be done there there is a policy for that but i think it is undercooked but uh, that it should be more uh, focus oriented and then second is yeah you need to reduce some vulnerability in the sense learn at least how to have an ecosystem of making chips uh, over time uh, so that's how i would say no one is trying to be self sufficient uh, in this area even though atmanirbhar is a common phrase but uh, i think the people who are in the policy understand that no country in this segment is atmanirbhar and so can't india be so ideas where which part of the segment you have says that you have a leverage point were any other nation state to contest you you have something to play in this uh, entire supply chain that's the thing. wonderful with that i say thank you very much um, some of you i know have raised your hands and have questions i'm sure pranay will be more than happy to talk to you outside and if you want to get a book copy of the book and even get his autograph i'm sure he'll be happy to oblige pranay thank you very much for a very engaging talk a big round of applause to him and, uh, thanks shrini thanks bsc and thanks all of you for the good